This video is going to examine a brand new way to calculate probabilities, the multiplication rule. This particular rule only works for independent events. So to see why a rule like this is necessary, let's look at a quick example using a fair coin. And I'm going to define two events and we might ask something like this what's the probability of getting both heads and tails in one flip and we would write that using notation we've seen before obviously this probability is zero these events are mutually exclusive and another type of question we might ask is something like what's the probability we get heads then tails in two flips so let's think about this for a second we're talking about two flips of a fair coin so we could say okay what's the sample space it is four ordered pairs and these are all equally likely outcomes and so using a bit of notation I could say what is this it's the probability that the first flip is heads then the second flip is tails and what is that it is how many ways can we do that? Just one, this one way. Out of how many ways can we flip two coins? Four. So that probability is one out of four. And that's not anything new. We're just counting, we're counting. But here's a question. What if the coin isn't fair? What if the probability of tails was slightly less than the probability of heads? And this technique of just counting isn't going to work because now our sample space here of four outcomes are not going to be equally likely anymore. So we want to know the probability that the first flip is heads and the second flip is tails. And to do that, we're going to use what's called the multiplication rule. Here's something that I want you to change in your book. I, unless you are renting this book, I literally want you to take this rule, which appears on page 260, and mark out this and down here because if we were using this and for this type of probability we would say the probability of heads and tails which makes it sound like we want to know the probability of those happening at the same time but we are going to change this to be then this is going to be the probability of e then f so this then is going to remind us that these are not at the same time when we want to know the probability of H then T, we are looking for a different kind of probability than the probability of H and T. And so what do we need to do? All we need to do is take their separate probabilities and multiply them together. And I want to point out that although they have this just for two events here, this works for multiple independent events, as many as you want, actually. So this makes this probability pretty quick to calculate. The probability of H then T is just the probability of H times the probability of T, which is 24.75%. This is a tool where we don't have to have equally likely outcomes. All we need is independent outcomes, and we said coin flips are independent. So let's look at another couple of examples using this same idea. So this is from section 5.3 and it's number 25. And the problem says we've got Ralph and he's bowling. Good job, Ralph. 30% of the time he gets a strike. And they ask here, what is the probability that Ralph gets two strikes in a row? And just as a reminder, they don't state this explicitly, but we need to assume his roles are independent. Whatever happens on his first roll doesn't affect the probability of what's going to happen on his second roll. So we want to know the probability he gets two strikes in a row. Well, I could write that using my new notation. It's the probability that the first roll is a strike, then the second roll is a strike, which we said is just multiplying their individual probabilities together, which is 9%. That's the probability that he'll get two strikes in a row now they want to know the probability that he gets three strikes in a row, which we said his rolls were independent, so it's just the probability of a strike times itself three times. The probability of a strike cubed, which is 2.7%. So using this multiplication rule, we see that the probability keeps going down if we want him to get more strikes in a row. 
and that's what we would intuitively expect. He has a 30% chance just to get one strike, and to get two strikes in a row, that goes down to 9%, and to get three strikes in a row, that goes down to less than 3%. If we ended up adding these probabilities for whatever reason, our answer would go up as we introduced more strikes in a row. And intuitively, that seems wrong. You can always think about, well, hey, does my answer make sense? It makes sense that the probabilities go down as we talk about more strikes in a row. So then your book asks another question, starting with a sentence I think is incorrect. So we're just going to ignore this sentence and focus on what it asks. It says, determine the probability that Ralph gets a turkey but fails to get a clover. What is a clover for you non-bowlers? That's four strikes in a row. So what does this mean? That's the probability that the first three rolls end up being strikes, but then the fourth one is not a strike because he's not getting a clover. So what is that? It's the probability of a strike times itself three times, times the probability of not getting a strike, which is going to be 70%. Either you get a strike or you don't. These are complementary events. And so we get 0 0.0189, which is 1.89%. So you'll notice that this answer involved us multiplying the probabilities of four events, but because they were independent, we're allowed to do that. Let's look at one more sample problem from the book that introduces a interesting way to take advantage of the complement rule to calculate probabilities. So this is actually an earlier problem from section 5.3 and we're given that the probability that a 40 year old male will live to be 41 years old, ooh, a little morbid here, is luckily very high, 0.99757. And now we've got a question. What's the probability that two randomly selected 40-year-old males will live to be 41 years old? So we're assuming that whether one makes it or not doesn't influence whether the other person makes it to be 41 or not. They're independent, so we can use the multiplication rule. And so that's the probability that the first lives, then the second lives, which is just this number squared. And fortunately, this number stays very high. So it went down slightly, but not very much because there was a very high probability that individually they both live. So together, it's still a fairly high probability that they both live. So the next question is the probability that five randomly selected 40-year-old males will live to be 41 years old, which is basically just five different events strung together with thens, and those five events all have the same probability. It's the probability that somebody lives to the fifth power, which is still quite high. It's over 98%, which is good news for males that are 40 years old. And then they ask what is a bit more complicated of a question. What's the probability that at least one of five randomly selected 40-year-old males will not live to be 41 years old? Why this is a little bit more involved than those earlier two probabilities is because what the words at least one mean. Let's look at this. We are examining five randomly selected 40-year-old males. And we're going to count out of them the possible outcomes for the number that don't live to 40. Well, that's the sample space, and maybe that could be zero of them, or one, or any of the numbers up to five. And it's kind of weird to define this as the number that don't live to 40. Let's just call it the number that die. That's the same thing. Dying is the same thing as not living to 40. Kind of a sad problem here, but death is a fact of life. So we could define some event A to say, okay, this event is what we're looking for. It's the event where at least one person dies. Well, what are the outcomes that are associated with that? At least one means it could be one or it could be anything more than one. At least one person dies means maybe one person dies or two or three or four or five people die. And there's lots of ways this can happen. And these are mutually exclusive outcomes. So we could find the probability of one and add it to the probability of two and add that to the probability of three and it would continue. But that would just be pretty challenging. So what we're going to do is look at the complement of this event that at least one dies. If that doesn't happen, then what happens? Nobody died. Yay. And that only has one possible way it can happen. 
and that probability is going to be fairly straightforward to calculate. But why do we care about that, the probability of a complement? Well, we've got this rule that says, hey, the probability of some event A and the probability of its complement, because they're everything that can happen, those have to equal one. So if we, we wanna find the probability of some event, we can always just say that a probability is one minus the probability of its complement by just doing a small amount of algebra there. At least one are keywords that we are going to use the complement rule. So what's the probability that nobody dies? The language in this problem is a little bit confusing, but nobody dying is the same thing as everyone living. And we actually already found that probability. We found it in part B because we had five people and part B asked us for the probability that all five of them make it to the next year, which this is the probability that nobody dies. So we can use that right here. But we're not done yet because we want the probability of A. We want the probability that at least one person dies, which by our trusty complement rule up here is going to be one minus the probability of a complement, which is 1.21%. There's a low probability that in a group of five 40 year olds that at least one of them don't live to be 40, AKA at least one of them dying. And why is that? That's because there's a high probability that they all make it. So I know this seems like a fairly complex problem, but what did we look for? We looked for at least one in the problem. And if we see this, then we should use the complement rule. If you get confused, or even if you don't get confused, I highly recommend you write out all the possible outcomes and the sample space will help you understand that if we want the probability of at least one of something that means a bunch of outcomes but the complement of that is only one possible outcome and so we'll use the complement rule to take advantage of this so I hope you found this video helpful and thanks for watching I uh, will see you next time